Hello and welcome back to this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine from scratch. In this episode, we're going to take a break from building the functionality in the virtual machine and take a tour through the assembly language that the VM will support and some of the other features of the assembler, which turns assembly code into machine code. So far, we've been communicating with the VM by injecting our programs as raw machine code bytes into memory and letting the machine run. But that's not the most convenient nor the most maintainable way of doing it. Instead, we should be using an assembly language. An assembly language is one abstraction level higher than machine code. And when I use the term abstraction here, I mean it allows us to forget some of the details of the lower levels. To illustrate this, take a look at how many different opcodes we have to describe data moving instructions. In assembly language, we can abstract all the details of those various opcodes away into a single instruction move. And depending on which operands or arguments we give, the assembler, the program which will turn our assembly code into machine code, can choose the correct opcode for us. Now, this assembly language is going to have a couple of key features that I think will make it pleasant to use, the primary being a first-class module system. And though this module system will not be particularly advanced, it will help with creating and organizing different blocks of assembly code and raw data. These modules work a little bit differently than they do in JavaScript. For starters, only a top-level module can include other modules. Here is a highly simplified top-level module for what a simple game might look like. Though it's important to note here that any code which is shown during this episode is only for illustration. It doesn't really do anything meaningful. We're only really focusing on the syntax. So this game module actually only consists of a bunch of imports. It doesn't even have any assembly code. All the assembly code is found inside the modules that this top level module imports. We've got a module that will define our interrupt vector. That's something we'll talk about in future episodes. We have one which defines the main game loop, which is the piece of code that gets user input, updates the game logic, then draws a frame forever and ever and ever until we stop the game. Then we have one for game physics, one for AI, a module for tile data, and a module called object data, which might keep track of something like game objects, their positions, speeds, types, sprite data, etc. Now the import statement itself consists of a few key parts. The name that we're going to give to this module, the address where it will be placed in memory, the file path, and an optional set of parameters that this module will get access to. Parameters are kind of like arguments to a function. So when a module is included, it can be given some extra information. For example, the address of an important subroutine or piece of data at assembly time. In this case, the game physics module is receiving some configurable parameters for things like gravity and friction meaning we can tweak the behavior of the physics module without having to change the physics code itself. This also receives an object data table address, and you'll see that this comes directly as an export from the object data module. Whenever we are referencing a variable in this assembly language, it's wrapped up in square brackets. The module exports are in some ways similar to JavaScript, except they're much simpler. Let's take a little peek into the interrupt vector.mod file. It's quite simple. It only defines some bytes in memory in a specific place that represents addresses. The CPU will jump to these addresses when it receives certain signals called interrupts. We'll dive deeper into interrupts in a future episode, but for now you can think of them as a kind of callback function for an event handler. We can place data directly into our assembled code using the data keywords. Data 16 here tells our assembler that we're placing 16-bit values. Table is just a symbolic name we're giving to the address where this data will end up. And we can export this name to the top-level module with a plus sign. This allows us to be explicit about what is a private variable inside a module. Now let's take a look at a module with some code inside. This module specifies the parameters which can be passed from the outside. 
In this case, it's the difficulty byte that we saw in the beginning. That value can be used later inside instructions. The AI module has two subroutines. The first we consider to be a local subroutine because it's not exported with the plus symbol in front. The second is exported and is thus available for reference in the top level module. The sum local routine will simply end up at the address that the top level module specified, in this case hex 1800, because the assembler's default behavior is to place all code inside a module sequentially using the address that the top level module specified as the starting point. The sum exported routine is placed at an explicit memory location using the place at keyword. This keyword allows us to overwrite that assembler default behavior. As you can see, we can actually perform fairly complex calculations. The exclamation mark lock is a special variable that the assembler passes to all modules from the top level module that tells them the address where they've been placed in memory. The routine size is a function which is built into the assembler and that allows us to calculate how many bytes a section of code takes up. And of course, we're free to use things like constants, so we have hex 100 there as well. Aside from modules, there are a couple of other high level features which make this assembly language nice to use. One of these features is structures and we can take a peek at the object data module to get an idea about those. A structure is simply an organized block of memory where we make an association between certain positions in that block and names that we consider meaningful. In this file, we have a structure called game object, which keeps track of tile data about this object, as well as its position and some extra data. The at symbol at the beginning of the line says that this is a global export which means all modules can use this name without having to have it explicitly passed in. Each property in the structure is made up of a certain number of bytes. The tile offset is two bytes wide, but the tile is only one. You can see below that a table is exported, which is initialized with the data structure keyword. This simply allows us to set up an area of memory that takes up as many bytes as the structure does. The export only contains the address of this data, so we only need to export the first item of our table. We could also specify individual properties of each game object uh, when creating table entries, but if we don't specify anything, then all of the values will be set to zero. Now, like everything in low level land, we are projecting the meaning onto the bytes in memory. This structure definition doesn't actually have any real meaning in the final binary machine code. It's only there for the programmer's benefit. And so we can tell the assembler about the concept of game objects. What that means in practice is that we can be more expressive in the code. Let's take a very small assembly example to see how. Here we've received ball as a parameter in this module. Ball is the address of a game object inside the object data table. But in our instructions, by telling the assembler that we want to treat ball as a game object structure, we can actually get the addresses of the individual properties just using dot syntax. Let's contrast that with how we might express that without structures. The dot syntax has been replaced by a constant offset of three bytes, which is where the X property can be found. Now you might not think this is too bad, and really it isn't that bad. But the problem here is that code is always going to be more messy than this tiny contrived example. Three is going to mean a lot of different things in a lot of different places in the code. And when that code gets more complex, it can be nice to have a little helping hand allowing you to forget some of the more inconsequential details, like exactly how many bytes offset is the property X from the start of the game object. And we could achieve this in multiple other ways, like having, for example, constants. And the assembler will allow for those too, but structures have some additional benefits. We can also do something like this, which will generate a move memory to register opcode based on the address of the something offset by however many bytes the game object takes up. Doing this with constant values alone is much worse because you need to manually create constants for all of the property offsets 
and also the size of the structure, and making sure that they're in sync. If you add a new property to game object, like speed, but you forget to update your constant, your code is going to break in very confusing ways. Structures let you mentally offload the details of these considerations to the assembler. I want to emphasize that these features, like modules, imports, exports, and structures, they're not actually necessary, but they give us a nice opportunity to see how to build systems like this. And they give some exposure to some of the problems that we might bump into along the way. And of course, it wouldn't be a low-level JavaScript episode without mentioning trade-offs. And it's important to keep in mind that any time you build an abstraction, that abstraction has a cost. You always need to recognize the cost and understand if the benefits you get justify it. In the next episode, we're going to start building the parser, which takes assembly code and turns it into a structured tree representation, an AST, which the assembler will eventually be able to use to generate binaries. We're going to use the arc second library to build the parser, which is a well-tested parser combinator library very similar to the one we built in parser combinators from scratch. If we bump into any complex features using the library that weren't covered in that series, I'm going to make sure to add extra episodes to explain those concepts too. Thanks to all the patrons that support this channel. You'll find useful links in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.